those who don't know, um, I'm Samal. I'm the president of Polyfounders. And I'm Rushi, vice president of Polyfounders. And uh, who has heard of Polyfounders before? Like, raise your hand. Cool. So, uh, Polyfounders is at the core an entrepreneurship community. Right? We're focused on startups, innovation. Uh, we love just building a community of people who are like like-minded individuals who want to do something you know bigger than just. Um, get a, a nine to five job and actually do like make an impact in the world, right? Right. We're about a revolution, right? Polyfounders is about a mindset of, of changing barriers, breaking barriers. We want to be empowering people, especially in this club and on our community, and that's what we're set out to do. So we're glad you guys can make it out to this event. Um, we're thankful to our speakers here today for making time out of their schedules and coming out with us here at Polyfounders and giving us a little taste of uh, the ice cream and passion pastry. Cool. So, I mean, uh, I don't take much of your time, but without further ado, I want to introduce Nick. We're going to kick off the meeting tonight. So give it up for Nick. Hi guys, uh, my name's Nick. Um, I know you guys are more excited for what Andy has to say, but I'll be opening for you guys. Um, basically, I started up an Italian shoe company um, where I based, I do all my designs in LA, and I fly out to the designer couture district with Gucci, Prada, Todd's, any of those big houses, and I make my sneakers and footwear. Um, I'll tell you guys a little bit why I'm here. My business has been up for a year, and I've been doing it for two years, uh, as I was in college, and I'll go into that a little bit later. So really I'm here for to tell you guys what it's like being in the moment, um, turning that dream into reality, or trying to turn that dream into reality is what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, so let's take a step back and I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in OC, I was actually born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, if anyone's from there. But anyways, um, I went to school, my main hobby in school was in academics, but it was collecting sneakers. I can tell that's where my career is now. Um, growing up, playing basketball, you always want the cool sneakers on the court. And uh, that turned into an obsession, which later fueled my um, collection of 250 Jordans. Um, through middle school, through high school, I found just like buying, reselling. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the market that you can make some money off of it. And um, yeah, so that kind of that's where it all started. My first job was in the finish line. My second job was at finish line. Uh, my second job was at with Nordstrom. I left a little bit to do personal baking with Chase. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the preset. And um, through high school, I'll tell you guys how this all kind of cultivated itself and where all my environment kind of cultivated who I am today. Um, in high school, uh, you'll find similarities between me and Andy, actually. Uh, in high school, I did really bad in the first two years. I think I had a 2.0 in it. And it, um, my third year, I had my epiphany moment where I was like, okay, what do I really want to do? Um, Growing up in an Asian American household, your parents like be an accountant, be a doctor, be a chemist, be something cooler than a footwear designer. And um, yeah, so I kind of pulled all my stuff together, joined every club possible, um, pulled all my academics together. I ended up graduating in 4.2. Uh, funny enough, life doesn't turn out the way you want it to. So when I applied, I wrote about sneakers, as you guys can probably guess I would write about in my personal statements. And uh, that got me rejected to every college possible. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was an awesome feeling to uh, pick up your life and then have it fall apart together. So I took about a year uh, crying on a treadmill at the gym. Um, and then I picked myself back up. So to not say too many cliches is that um, it's not about how you fall, it's about how you get back up. And uh, so I went to Golden West Community College. I don't know if you guys know where that is. It's out in OC. Um, pretty much the worst community college you can go there, and my mindset behind that was go to the worst place that feels like a glorified high school so that you want to get out. And uh, I did all the X's and O's. Um, I wrote my personal statement, as you can guess again, I said, nah, F it, let's do it again. I wrote about sneakers again. Um, but this time I wrote about it in a more business foundated mindset where the academic board will appreciate what I do. So I wrote about this Instagram that started up, we started up a group that I followed on Nike Talk, I don't know if you guys ever heard of it, it's a forum. And uh, we got the Roshi, Nike Roshi on it. I don't know if you guys heard of that shoe before. Um, we started Team Roshi and we hit 500,000 organic followers and they sent us to Nike and asked us how we did that. So that's the experience, my business exposure that I wrote about to get to USC is where I ended up going. Um, yes, brand name, very expensive. I'm getting killed this June with $500 per month. Um, but yeah, so I went to USC and uh, this is kind of like where you guys are at. I actually just graduated last year. So um, like I said in the beginning, this is I'm here to be as relative as you guys are. Um, I think going into college, like the biggest thing I took away, yeah, there's academics, yada, 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 right? You'll probably use 10% of it in the workforce when you get out of here. There'll be a lot of uh, PLSs that will do your job for you. 
Um, but the biggest thing was the network that I created. So just like you guys joining clubs is a huge thing, and you never know who you met. So I'm going to shout out to two people that I met right when I got into USC my first year, um, which is Peter Ola, who's, uh, I was talking to the kid, and I'm like, I'm a kid from Westminster, you know, middle, middle class family, we don't have much, there's nothing like, aside being the first generation college student, and his grandfather um, was one of the founders of how do you turn uh, ethanol energy, which is I think through corn and stuff like that, and I'm like, oh crap, cool, I'm from Westminster, I collect sneakers, very cool. And then the second person I met, um, which really made an impact, was Wise Rahim, who started uh, Project.co, I don't know if any of you guys are from uh, Indian descent, but he, so if you guys are familiar with Kickstarter, he started a crowdfunding source uh, service out in India. And uh, now he's on Forbes, uh, I think it's called 30, going in 30 or something like that, which is basically if you're under 30, you can be this big old group. Um, so yeah, so, and I'm sitting there and now I just got in, I'm a transfer student and I'm like, holy crap, like I want to do something cool like that. I don't want to just graduate and do the nine to five. It's great, like that, I'm actually just starting to apply for my nine to five stuff just because I got all my infrastructure with this done. So now like reality hits, you have to live in reality while you're chasing your dreams. I think that's a very important thing. And uh, yeah, so from there, that's basically how I created my environment and how it cultivated me to today. So my third step is I'll tell you guys about how you go about or how you can go about starting something like what I started. And uh, my journey is a little bit different. As you guys know, all my jobs were in footwear. Um, my internship, I call it an internship, it was actually me just bugging somebody that I knew that was in the industry. Um, I worked with a company that's called Pacific Shoe Company, which owns like eight different independent footwear brands. And um, basically they're like maybe 10 miles from my house. I would call the dude that I knew there and said, hey, can I come to the office? And I would go to the office maybe two, three times, four times a week, as many times as I could because I commuted from OC to USC. So I would leave at 4.45 a.m. and come home around 6. So I'd go to that office and uh, just watch what these independent designers, what they appreciated in footwear, what they appreciated in the craft, um, what their vision was. And my two years there, and I still consult there every day pretty much um, going there, two years there I really took that um, whatever you start, whatever industry it may be, whether you guys go in apparel, whether you guys go in the food, whether you guys go in the tech, um, really, what I like to say is called move culture. So whatever you go into, do your research, figure out how the people that are innovating it, how they're moving culture. And uh, to move culture, it's really creating a voice for yourself. For me, obviously this is a longer explanation, I'll turn it to layman's term. Um, for sneakers, uh, everything was about quality materials. Materials have, let's take leather, it has thousands of different grades and thousands of different ways of processing. In today's industry, the way the back-end buyers and wholesale works is that everyone wants a cheap price, so you get cheap quality footwear. Um, I'm reverting that and going back to the origins in artisan craft, where I take stories that are like crazy enough for me to appreciate. Like I'll show you one this really quick one. This is called a vegetable tan sneaker. Um, it's not painted over. Like you see leather like this, it's painted over. It's not chemically induced. This color is done by extracting pigments from vegetables. And the cool story aspect about it is that if you leave this shoe in the sun, the vegetable pigments will absorb the sunlight and change colors in the shoe. So think of a mood ring, think of something that changes colors over wear. So, and also this tannery is one of 25 tanneries, 23 tanneries that is part of a guild that dates back this tradition to the Middle Ages. So we're talking like year 800 kind of thing. Um, so that's like kind of the stories that I put into my footwear. I know most of you guys don't care about footwear, but that's what I, that's my niche. Um, so yeah, that's how I kind of got about it. I made connections when I was going to that office every day and I said, hey, I really want to start a footwork company because I was still in love with sneakers. I love dress shoes. I understand how dress shoes are made, but I just wanted to make a really cool sneaker with the utmost best craft that you can get. And uh, so um, connected me with someone in Italy in the Designer Couture District. And the initiative, I got resourceful enough. I sold off that 200 feet, 250 piece collection. I came out about 25 grand up. And uh, then I asked my parents for another 15,000. And uh, never leaving the west coast, I flew over to Italy where I almost got in a car accident leaving the parking structure at the airport. Um, and I somehow made it to the factory and was able to pitch my idea, pitch them the designs and said, this is what my vision, this is how I want to move culture. Um, and they say, let's do it. So the first year, still new, never been in the apparel industry, never been like a fashion guy. I, you know, I just wanted to be an accountant after I graduated. And, uh, I said, let's do it, and I made my first design. It was a red, white, and black shoe, similar to this. This is a prototype that I did two years ago. And um, I got lucky. I launched my website. I, I'm a one-man team. I just picked up my first person that's helping with UX and UI, basically recapturing purchases and all that stuff. Um, 
And um, I got lucky, I got a couple NBA players, Andre Drummond, if you guys follow the NBA players, Andre Drummond, Corey Joseph, Daniel Russell, Jordan Clarkson, any of those kind of guys that you know. Um, and just got lucky, I was sliding through DMs, trying to do whatever I can, you know. <laughs> I was sliding through DMs, trying to do whatever I can to get my shoes out there, because like I said, I've never been in the industry, so I mean, everyone will always say this, and I always tell people like, oh, when someone asks me, what would you do different? I'll be like, oh, I, work, I would work for a big fashion company, and then create all the network, and then start something up. Sometimes you just don't do that and you make the jump and hope everything's all right And today basically you just have that mindset you're back up to the wall and you're fighting to save your life kind of thing um, Being so young like you guys like losing 50,000 is pretty much the end of the world on top of your school loans um, So yeah um, Today where Collegium's at is uh, it's about a year old. We've broken even every single time So I think my first quarter in business I did over 100,000 in sales, but that's essentially breaking even you start one silhouette You have to buy one other production run um in the last 90 days, we did about 25,000 sales, so there's a 30% growth, which is the benchmark that I set in part of my business plan, by your business plan, you will have to write that out to be respected in the industry. Um, you can go in it going gung-ho like I did, and then you realize, oh shoot, when I present this to people, they want to know what you learned in school, this is the 10% that you need. They want to see a five-year business plan, a 10-year business plan, your quarterly sales, and you know whatever your uh, uh, estimates are gonna be. So you do have to do something like that. And today, um, I'll tell you something, you just kind of, got to keep going. Um, Andy always tells me this, I've exhausted all my options, and I have. Like, like I said, I've never been in the industry, so I'm just going as it goes. And uh, every day you just got to try to create a lane for yourself that might not be there tomorrow. And I consulted with Andy just the other day. I don't know if you guys follow the brand because I love ugly, shout out to the jacket. But um, they gave me this jacket and I went to their office because they really, quote unquote, we really have with you kind of thing. And um, so I told them my story, and they really like it. They're on La Brea, which is one of the fashion streets in Los Angeles. Rent goes anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000 a month. And uh, they were so kind enough to offer me spots on their, on their shelf space. So I'm looking at free shelf space for people to come out. And uh, this is the prime and epitome example. If you go out there, put yourself out there, and it's the most traditional way, I'm gonna go to a store and say, well, what if they like my stuff? Let's do it, you know? There's, there's not too much education behind that. You can just go in and have the balls to do it. And um, the first day they wore my stuff, Big Sean Stylist walked in. This was actually today. And uh, I get a text, a phone call, I'm like, yo, Big Sean Stylist is really messed with your stuff. Like, we, we're going to suit him up for the whole Europe trip. So tomorrow i got to drive back over there, um, drop off a bunch of shoes, figure out what he likes, and style them. And um, that's kind of the exposure. Like, you do a bunch of cool things. Like, I think the most important thing, like, I'll wrap this up. Um, you'll never know what happens first off. Two things that I want you guys to take away from whatever I've learned these past three years is uh, one, make an action plan that's feasible for you. Whatever you want to do, whatever industry it is, make an action plan. And the most important part I found out was making very detailed baby steps. You're going to have this crazy goal and dream to change the world, just like your presidents and founders said. Um, but you can't do that with all these baby, step, the baby steps that you need to take. Um, the thing about being in the apparel industry, at least what I found out, is that you'll never stop learning. Um, there'll be something, whether it's design, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's in sales, whether it's in the tech side, that you will never be able to read out of a book, and you have to grab it as it comes and learn as quickly as possible before it takes you over. And so the detailed baby steps prevent you from you know, falling over those kind of things. And the second thing is, um, I think this is the most important that kind of shaped me to be able to do something like this, is um, you're a product of the environment that you create, so the people that you hang out with, the people that you hang out here, the people that you hang out back home, um, if they're doing the typical SoCal, let's go to a kickback, let's get pretty messed up, and then wake up the next day and do the same thing over, you're gonna be doing that blink 25, which happens again. Um, but um, yeah, so be able to create the environment that you wanna do, um, calibrate, you know, how much fun you wanna have and how much work you wanna put in through, because um, even today, like, this is never easy. There's days where I'm crying at my desk, trying to figure like, crap, okay, I just sold 40,000. Now I'm putting it all back in and let's do it again. And then you have to start completely from scratch and figure out where to go from there. So uh, it's not an easy thing, but if you love what you do, uh, it'll never be work. So that's pretty much it. I'll hand it off to Andy, which is gonna be but, uh, Thanks guys. being at school, uh, it's tough, it's hard to be here, uh, so thank you for spending your night to come out and hang out and listen to me speak and tell you guys a little bit about passing chasers and all the crazy stuff that I do. Um, 
I'm gonna start off with a question. Um, how many of you guys believe in having superpowers? Two, three, two, three. Okay. Um, how many of you guys imagine yourselves ever being like Spider-Man, Batman, Superman? Right, we all, yeah, a lot of us. Every day. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Um, how about something more interesting like Power Rangers or the Ninja Turtles or Mickey Mouse? Yeah. Uh, the reason why I, I bring up a lot of those characters are those are characters that you know, like I looked up to as a kid, or even now, you know, like all their great characteristics they have. You know, they want they want to be great. They're trying to find themselves. They're trying to um, figure out why they stand out in this world and, and what their special powers are. So that's why I love the whole superhero theme. Uh, let me ask you guys another question. Um, raise your hand if your parents want you guys to be like a doctor, a pharmacist, a lawyer, a teacher. Keep your hands up if that's something you want to be. <laughs> that's why we're in the Poly Founders Club right now. <laughs> um, great careers to have, great thing to have. Obviously, I didn't choose that route. I chose a completely different route. Uh, before I get more into career, my career and superpowers, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my story. Um, my name is Andy Nguyen. I'm a Vietnamese American. I was born in Fountain Valley, California. Um, I grew up my entire life in Westminster, California. Anyone know where Westminster is? Vietnamese infested area. <laughs> uh, I, grew, I was born and raised in that area my, my entire life. Um, I was young, I was, when I was a young kid, I was a little awkward, but weird. Uh, I got this funny little haircut with a ball in my head. Uh, uh, growing up in uh, the Westminster area, if you're, if you know what my age group, I'm a little older. Uh, it was a gang infested area, a lot of gangs, and it was, it was different from what it is now. And I always had a tough time like, fitting in and finding myself. And grade school was tough. Uh, going to junior high got tough. And I got to high school. In high school, I started getting the worst grades possible. Nick, Nick got 2.0, but I was, I was under, I was like at the one point area. So, not, not a good look. Um, I always heard bad things about high school when I was from junior high going to high school. I was like, oh, this is going to be a bad place. Like, everyone says gay, you can get beat up, you can get picked on. And, and I let those thoughts get to my head. And once I got to high school, that was exactly what happened. I got picked on. And I started getting fights. I got suspended. I got arrested. I got all of those things. And next thing you know, I got kicked out of school. And what would your parents do? You guys got kicked out of school. Uh, it is. So they asked me. They asked me two questions. This is like two like two questions that they asked. Me. Two questions they asked me to go. First question: um, How are you born in America, failing in English, and Asian failing math at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured out how to do both. Obviously. Um, so I got sent to this thing called Continuation School. You guys heard of Continuation School? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that place fucking sucks. <laughs> uh, continuation School, for me, it was a place like it was a creepy office away from the school. Like, it wasn't even close to school. It's like in this weird little building. You go there, pick your homework up, and you complete it, you just turn it in. It's the same cycle over and over again. And then what I always remember was I lived right across the street from high school. And I had to look at the window every single day at 2.38. The bell rings, I see all my friends coming out and hanging out, and I can't leave and I can't do anything. And I, I lose out, I'm not losing out on that social life. I started losing out on, on who I was and getting depressed, and like, this, this is not what I want to do, this is not who I want to be. So obviously, you have two, you have two choices at that point. I could either stay in continuation school and probably graduate early and then start committing college early, or I could go work hard and figure out after the school if I could come back in. So my sophomore year, I worked, I worked really hard. And I requested that I get back to the school, so they let me back to the school, and I started participating. You know, I wanted to—I had to think about the superhero me. Yeah, I got to think about who I was and who, who I really am, and not about letting people dictate like who I want to be and trying to fit in. So I came back and was like completely who I thought I was, and I had fun and I started particip participating in a lot of the clubs. You see here, everyone has the same last name as me, Nguyen. Nguyen, 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 Nguyen. Uh, I'm that second dude, not the white one, the one right under the white one. That's me, and you see under my name, Andy Nguyen. Uh, I'm in the most clubs in that entire senior class. Um, choir, basketball, dance, impact club, key club, anything, any club you can join, I would have joined it. If Polly Founders was there, I would have joined it too. <laughs> 
Uh, but that, that was a, a great time for me, it was junior and senior year, I came back and did, I didn't do no 4.2, but you know, 3, 3, point, 3 point something was, was good enough for me at that time. Um, I started discovering who I was and what I got into and I started figuring out my hobbies and hobbies were like dressing up and hitting on girls and yada yada. Uh, I, got, I got named the school's best dressed. Um, in this picture here, I got like a denim suit on, it's like 3XL long. I have like Dragon Ball hair, I got a bandaid on my face. <laughs> yeah, a little different. Uh, uh, I also got named the school's social butterfly. Uh, for the troublemaker, you know, I completely changed who I was. I gave that. You know, I wanted to be, I was trying to find myself, I was trying to be, I knew I was, I was a different person, so it was okay to be different, so I took that social butterfly award. Um, and then I graduated, graduated high school, and I, I was like, I'm gonna go to college, and I'm gonna kill it. I'm gonna do really well this time. And I got to, I, had, I, had, I didn't have a lot of choices for college, obviously, when you get kicked out of school, you don't get a lot of choices. Cal Poly Pomona will be in for sure. So I had to go to Community College. I went to Orange Coast College. Uh, I started taking career planning classes, took all my gen ed classes, and I started slumping again. I couldn't, I couldn't focus. I was out of my, I felt like I was out of my element again. So, I got frustrated, I was like, okay, this, is, this sucks, like, why can't I figure out what I want to do? So, I decided to become a gangster rapper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I didn't decide to be a gangster rapper. But I did wear that for reals. Uh, this is my best friend, Polo. Uh, my best friend, Polo, went to OCC for about six months. And then he decided to drop out because he started getting into real estate. Anyone here want to get into real estate? Two people. Um, I was on the other side of the fence about that. Um, he started doing real estate and he, he approached me and he said, I'm making a lot of money doing real estate appraisal right now. Um, do, you want to, do you want to start a company doing real estate? I was like, I don't know anything about real estate. I, don't, I have no idea what that term means. I know something about houses and selling it and buying it, something like that. So he said, you can start your own company though. I was like, well, I'm 19 years old. So I guess I'll try it out. So I, I decided, I, I, we all went to get our, try to get our license, like five of us, five of us guys, and I'm the one that passed. I got my, I got my real estate license. We started a company called Home Source Appraisal. Home Source Appraisal, I started this when I was 19 years old. and. I was making a lot of money early on. Like I'm making a lot of money, but I quickly learned I hated it. <laughs> this sucks. If, you, if I have to remember what I did back then in real estate, all I remember is holding a measuring stick and measuring people's houses and holding a camera and taking pictures of other people's houses. That's pretty much it. And maybe sitting by a computer inputting things. I don't remember anything else because I hated it that much. Um, during the same time period, uh, I, I reconnected with one of our friends, and he was starting up his own clothing brand. And when he started his own clothing brand, he he called me up. He said, uh, I, "Can you model my clothes?" I was like, "What? I'm not a model?" He's like, "I'll give you free clothes." I was like, "All right, I'm, I'm in. I'm doing it. Whatever you want, whatever clothes you want me to do, I'll do it." So he gave me free clothes, and I did the photo shoot. Uh, here's one of the pictures. There's a lot. There's a lot of embarrassing ones, but that's why I chose this one. It's not as embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, this brand's called Eccentric Clothing, and after I did the photo shoot, we decided to share an office because he needed to find an office space, and I, and I was looking for an office space, so we decided to share, and I completely fell in love with the clothing industry, because I already you know, best dress in high school, and, and that was like my culture, and I understood it. So I, I was like soaking everything in, and I saw all the things that he was doing wrong, and I was like, I want to you know, get in this, and he had a fallout with his partner, and decided to start another clothing brand. And I asked him, uh, can I invest my money into your clothing brand? And he told me, no. I said, no? I said, why? He said, I don't think you're ready. I said, you don't think I'm ready? I'm ready. I said, I can do this. I, I was like, this, I know this, I, can, I, I love this, I, I can kill it. He said, no, I don't think you're ready. So I went back to my business partner, Polo, and I told him, you know what? Let's go start our own clothing brand. I can do this better than him. I know I can do this. I, I, I'll figure it out. Like, I'll learn everything I can, and then we'll start. We'll start our own clothing brand. So he decided to agree to it, and we created this brand called Hunking. 
Han King is short for Imaginary Kingdom. Uh, the reason why we came up with the name Imaginary Kingdom is the kingdom I refer to as your brain. That's the most valuable thing you own. And that's where all your ideas come from. So imaginary, imagination, imaginary kingdom. And you break down and get the word I'm king, which is you just utilize both words. I'm king is like about being a leader, about the same things I run through in my life and about being a leader, being myself, uh, and pushing change, pushing, pushing culture. Um, started this brand in 2000, 2006. Um, if you've been to our events, you see people camping out overnight for t-shirts. Nick was one of them. Um, what separated our brand and got us, got us a lot of recognition early on was our, I believe, was our connection to the community, um, was understanding how to utilize the social market. Um, blogging was really big at the time, so we utilized sharing our story and about ourselves and all the things that we did great and all the things that we did bad. And we just showcased it onto our blog and we ran out things like the skating rink and the bowling alley and we paid, we paid for it just to give back to the people that supported us. Um, some of our images from our lookbooks that we've shot in the past. Uh, we've, been, we've been fortunate to work with cool companies like Nickelodeon. They hired us out to work with the SpongeBob on this particular project. And in my field, I also get a lot, I work with a lot of rappers, athletes, uh, actors, act actresses. Uh, been fortunate to work with Kendrick Lamar. Uh, I worked with Kendrick Lamar early, really, really early on when nobody knew who the hell he was. And he's running my office trying to grab free clothes. I'm like, what the hell, who is this guy? Get him out of my office. <laughs> uh, next thing I discovered, he's a really big deal. Uh, Justin Bieber, ladies, ladies, I think. Okay. Uh, Justin Bieber, uh, Big Sean, Nicki Minaj, Liz Khalifa. There's, there's a ton more I don't want to do a highlight reel of celebrities because it'd take all day if I, if I did that stuff. Um, so I did, I did, I did that for. Yesterday was actually the ninth year anniversary of the, the first day we shipped our clothes, so, which is pretty cool. And in my field, I get to travel a lot, obviously, in clothing in the clothing industry. You know, we got to be in stores like Zoomies, Tillys, Armaloo stores all around the world. And I got to travel, and as I traveled, I picked up new hobbies. And one of the new hobbies was food. And food, food was like a game for me. Like I used, I utilized like. You guys play like, what's that shooting game? Call of Duty. Your Call of Duty, mine was like Yelp. Yelp was against me. I travel, I'd find them places with the most reviews, and I'd hit them all the places. And I'd share that on my blog, and people start asking me, suggesting places, and it became like a real game for me. And one thing I, that always stood out early on in these unique places like San Francisco, New York, Japan, were interesting ice cream flavors. Ice cream flavors that I've never seen before, and I said, why don't we have anything cool like this in Orange County? We only have Baskin Robbins, Cold Stone, <laughs> and Thrifty, which is not bad, but it's boring. So I have this idea running in my head for two years, and me and one of my close friends, Scott, who I've known since second grade, um, connected, and we started talking about some other ideas outside of what we were already doing. And our ideas were, were, were pretty similar. And so we, we were like, okay, let's, let's go find an ice cream store. So we went and looked, went to a hunt for an ice cream store. And we ended up starting this brand called Actors Ice Cream. Um, and we're the creators of the Milky Bun. The Milky Bun is our version of the ice cream filled donut. It's cold ice cream on the inside, hot donut on the outside. Uh, we opened in this, this city called, do you guys know where Found Valley is? Canada. Before afters, you guys heard about afters, do you know where Found Valley was? <laughs> yeah, not many people. So we decided to open this place called Fountain Valley, um, which if you, before that, no one knew what Fountain Valley was. They thought it was literally in the valley. They were looking at, they were looking for it. What the hell is this place? Um, and we opened the store without a real sign. It says, it says ice cream. <laughs> and people, People would complain, like people would complain, like they would write bad Yelp reviews of like, right, those guys are, those guys are fucking cheap, they're stupid, they, don't, they can't put up a real sign. That was not the point of it, like we knew, like this sign, that's staying up forever by the way, we're never taking that down, it's always on the same we're never going to put after them, in that particular location. The reason why we did this in the first location was that 
it was our way of telling the traditional marketing and traditional ways of doing things like, your, way, your ways don't work anymore. Like, we're gonna do it completely different. So then they asked, well, how am I supposed to find the store? This, the thing doesn't even, the damn thing doesn't But I'm focused, and the reason why I keep doing this is because I want to push culture forward. I want to make it a great impact. Uh, I know that I'm in an opportunity that a lot of people don't have. A lot of people only get to do one business. I get to do six plus. So I'm trying to take advantage of it. Everyone says it's too much. Well, I'm still doing it. So once I get burnt out, that's when I'll start slowing down. Um, a few tips I'd like to share with you guys that I say to myself day over and over and over again. Passion over profit. Uh, the reason why I feel passion over profit is because when I started doing the things I enjoyed, it ended up taking care of me anyways. Uh, good thing I learned early on that real estate sucked. <laughs> and I didn't want to do things for money. That I quickly learned that if you do things that you really, really enjoy, it'll end up taking care of you anyways. Uh, things will not go the way you imagine. I had no idea two and a half years ago that I would be doing food. That was a complete hobby, and if you asked me at that time, what are you going to do? I was, like, I, was still, I, was, I was going to be doing clothing. But things happen for a reason, and I'm completely okay with how things turned out. That's why you guys get to enjoy the ice cream donuts. Um, you don't know how it's going to happen, and it's okay. Uh, you just kind of just, a year ago, the same thing with a year ago, I couldn't predict that I was going to open GD Bro Burger, Do Jelly, and Big Ben, but it kind of just happened, and I'm just taking the opportunity. You just kind of have to run with it. And your business plan that you guys create will probably change a hundred times over, but that's okay because you're evolving, you're getting better at it. There are no set rules to your path of success. And all you guys out here try to follow the same exact route, the same exact steps that I did from A to Z, you might not get the same results. Um, you have to find out what your core values are, what success means to you, and then you start lining up what your rules are. And that's what's going to lead you to success. My, my, what success means to me might not be the same for you guys. There are no set rules to your success. Every day is a new opportunity to better yourself. I yes, I run six companies, but it's super tough. You know, like every day there are new challenges. You guys just I just gotta show you guys the highlights here, but every day I go through things like you know, we have to run there's four hundred people working under my company. Half of them are Half of them are still in high school. It's, it's figuring out ways to work with them, making sure things are running smoothly, um, changing operations, opening a new store, and managing your, your stores at the same time is a tough thing to do. Um, so it's about putting things in place and making sure, making sure I wake up every day and tell myself. Some, some days I'm like, gee, this is, this is crazy. And I just have to remind myself that this is a great opportunity, so keep it going. Um, similar to what Nick said earlier, surround yourself with people who will show you that anything is possible. If you look at your five closest friends, you will most likely talk like the, act like the, uh, share the same hobbies. So if you hang around with the knuckleheads, you're most likely going to be a knucklehead. If you hang out with the good people, the solid people, the people that are doing great things, you're going to pick up from that. Uh, I have great, I have great group of friends um, that have tons of experience and that have no experience. And like, you know, like Nick, like the reason why I brought Nick here is because you know he's he's just starting, but I see the passion, I see how hard he's working, so I'm like, this, this you know, this is people I want to surround myself with because he's gonna drive me to be better. You no, know, even though he's just starting starting out, like he's I still get motivated and inspired to work ten times harder. So surround yourself with awesome people. A healthy mind. Um, the school I first spoke at last year, they asked me. <coughs> Speak about a healthy mind, and I had to figure out what a, what a healthy mind meant to me. And I had to, I narrowed it down to four things. Four things is one, you have to believe in yourself. Uh, a lot of people are not going to believe you; they're going to think you're crazy. My parents thought I was crazy when I told them to start my own clothing brand. If you, if you go and tell your Asian parent that you're going to start your own clothing brand, they're not going to be happy about it. And then I told them I'm going to start my own ice cream store. They're like, "What the hell are you thinking? How are you supposed to make money selling ice cream?" They don't question me anymore. <laughs> Third, go out and actually, actually do it, take action. A lot of people, you, you, we can sit here and talk and, and do things, but you have to actually take action. You take action, if you take action, that's when you start results happen. If you're not doing anything, you're not going to get any results, you're not going to know what's going to happen. Uh, that's the risk of starting being an entrepreneur and starting your own project, the risk of knowing, not knowing what's going to happen. And, of course, most of all, loving you. 
Um, important thing that I always take with me and I always try to tell people, when I'm 60 or 70 years old, which I'm still far from that, uh, I want to be, be able to share an amazing story with not just my grandchildren, but with other people and tell them that I didn't regret anything because I did this, anything I ever wanted to do, I went out and did it. Whether I succeeded or failed, I still went, in, went out and attacked it. And that's why I'm living this great story. I'm only a part of way in my life right now. I'm having a great time doing it. So make sure you create your story where it's helpful. Um, I may not have superpowers of flying through places and laser vision, but I can dress like it. Um, but when, I, when I talk about superpowers, you know, it's finding everyone has, I believe everyone has something special about them, something unique about them. Uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the smartest kid in the, in the group, of my group. I'm not, the, I'm not the most talented. I'm probably the least talented, but I'm the most driven. And I'm also great at putting teams together. And I'm great at connecting with people. I'm great at believing in myself. And that, I think that, those are some of my superpowers. And I believe that everyone has there. You just got to figure out how to unlock yours. <clears throat> some of my super friends, these are my partners from afters. Yes, that white guy is back to my partner as well. <laughs> 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 uh, but, you know, like I said, find your group of super friends. You'll, you'll start piggybacking off each other and figuring out things and share ideas and be open. Uh, push boundaries, have fun. Find out what your passion is, go after it. And the world is, nothing is impossible. And I will say that over and over again. Because I, after was a hobby, okay? That first door is a hobby and it's taken me completely this far into the food industry. And I'm having such a great time doing it and I have a great time coming to be able to hear and share my story. And I hope you guys find what you guys are passionate about. Thank you very much. Nick too. Nick, Nick. <laughs> for having us here. You know, you guys have a beautiful squad. I didn't expect it to look like this. I can't look like this. It's a really nice looking school. So. Thank you guys for having me here. And if you guys have any Q&A, this is a great time to ask. Like, if you have any questions, I'll share the best I can. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you said that when you were moving into something new, you would just find ways to be resourceful. Yes. Like you didn't, you you know, you weren't familiar with um, fashion or, or food. So I was wondering if you could talk more about that. Like, how did you going in blind? What did you do in terms of becoming resourceful? Um, in terms of being resourceful, I would obviously I didn't go to school. I stopped going to school already for a long time. So, but I don't. I didn't stop learning. Like I use, I still read books. I find out books that interested were interesting to me that were relatable to my subject, and I would start studying off that. I would find out, I would go and network with other owners, or network with other people that, okay, well, you're the marketing director of this company, I'm gonna keep bothering you until I get in the office and learn what I need to learn. And then I'll find out, and I'll pick on things that I think would work for me, and other things that wouldn't work for me. I'll be like, well, that works for you, but yeah. I wouldn't do that, so I'm gonna probably go a different route. But I would always find out what I would, I would think would work best for the company, like, I always refer back to like an iPhone, like the way people get excited about an iPhone, they go and camp out for that. Yeah. That's the way I get excited about things, like so, oh, I can build it, I get excited about it, I'm gonna go make that happen, I'll figure it out. If I can't get, get excited about it, I'm not gonna create it. So I made sure anything that I was getting involved in or any collaboration that we did, if I didn't get excited about it, just don't do it. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> so moving from like one business to another, um, how did you deal with like cash flow and stuff? Knowing cash that flow? Early on, we were trying to be really smart early on with when we were doing Unking Clothing, that was eight years of like, that was like my real learning experience. That's the first time I had to deal with, when I was doing real estate, I was doing most of the work within our like owners, like we didn't really hire out. When I first did Unking, like that's when we started hiring out and it was really tough for me to learn how to manage a team and learn how to speak and be a leader. Like if you, I, I was not speak, I was not a public speaker. I would not, like, I avoided, avoided all the, those public speaking stuff. So I had to figure out uh, with cash flow, we have times that we we almost lose our whole production because they fall off the boat. That's what they tell us. Um, so we'd have to figure out what, what do we do. So we tell our you know we make a deal with our vendors. Just take the order. 
the next order that comes in and just give us a discount. And then we work with the manufacturer and waiting until we get paid from the, or take a prepay from the order and then we'll just fund it out. So it's just about being smart trying to figure out, you know, things so there, happen. So there was like an element of risk like going forward. Oh, tons there. of risk. There's like there's some point, there's points in time that I was like, oh, this is, we're, we're screwed. Like our, our lives are, we're, we're done for. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what is your margin like between, like, how much do you make like per customer? I guess if like a note run is like between like six and eight dollars mm -hmm. then like per customer. Um, I'll I'll won't tell you exactly how much, yeah. but I will tell you that we are in that like one percentile and we are above sixty percent margin. Um, we're in a rare food category because we don't have we don't really have a lot of food waste. Yeah. And we have such a high um, high rate of customers coming in, mm -hmm. and then we also. Build out is very build out very easy for us. We don't really have free straps because we're not a real restaurant. We're just an ice cream store, so uh, most most people can't expand the way we can. So we're very very fortunate. We're like in that rare one percent time restaurant business. So that's why we're able to grow so quick. Like we have zero debt. We have zero we've brought zero money since we started. It's, everything's self funded through the, the company. Okay. So yeah. Oh man, I have two questions. I, I may be kept on it. Yeah, it's a, it's a video sheet. Um, I had two questions. One, I know you guys are debt free. Yeah. Uh, what was what was the most effective strategy of being debt free? Because that's huge. That allows you to make decisions with it without the element of you know investors or freaking out. So that that's my first question. Is how did you manage to be debt free? Uh, and then the second question was when you're you obviously have how do you guys make decisions when there's different people at the table who are so passionate about let's do it this way, no, let's do it this way. What's your guys' strategy though? Find a happy medium that works and make it consistent and harbor the relationships. Um, but the first question, how to be debt free? Obviously, we are a high margin company, so you know, well, we're, and you have a high rate of customers, so your, your sales like, per hour are just going through. It's about being smart about how to manage our labor, um, tighten up our labor. Um, food cost is really easy because it's like, <laughs> we're, super big, like, we're like pumping out ice cream like, all the time, so you know, we're, we're, we're super lucky. So yeah. We're really blessed in that, in that part. Um, so that's why, that's why we're that's why we're debt free. So we're able to grow so quickly in open stores and our, our stores are not that big. We're not we're not like a five thousand square foot like restaurant. We're like 1,200, 1,300 foot store. We don't really have seating inside and stuff like that. So, so you just use the one business growth to fund the next, and just kind of step by step it that way. Some and some of them yes, like with afters to like U Jelly, but then G Bro and Big Ben have a completely different group on that project. Um, and with as with the second to the second question. Can you repeat that second question? Yeah, uh, so when you have different people at the table you're working on projects with and everybody has different ideas, how do you guys keep the relationship cool and how do you guys have a smooth system for decision making that uh, doesn't cause conflict or ego? Everyone knows we all set out our roles. We have Obviously, partners are always the tricky part. So at the beginning when we started, we, everyone set out their roles. This is your this is your role. And you're going to take care of that. Like, you're not going to touch anything else. You can make your opinion on it, but at the end of the day, the person who's handling that role is going to take that responsibility and they're going to be accountable for it. And we have a CEO, our CEO in charge, and whatever the CEO makes, we're going to run with it, whether we like the decision or not. We're going to have to follow it, because that's all we voted. And we're going to run the CEO position. So if it's a great decision, cool. And if it messes up, we'll just go with it. Well, it's messed up, and next time we're not going to do it that way. So establishing everybody's beginning and end points, but still leaving, leaving the door open for opinions for exactly. the end of the day. Yeah, it's like, yeah. We, you know, we still vote, and we're still open. And as long as you can get your answer across, like, you, if you have an opinion, you better be able to back it up. You can't back it up. And your your opinion, next time your opinion is not going to count on the list. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's go Looking back. Uh, you say you hire a lot of younger workers. Yes. Um, and that can affect like turnover and stuff. Uh, along with training, how does that affect? Like, did you guys plan to uh, go for that younger demographic for your employees? Or? I think I think we took a lot of, of the fashion elements and the streetwear element of like you know like that that, that cool excited factor and the lifestyle of the music and everything, and that, that obviously that, that resonates with youth culture. So we wanted to make sure that we have an environment that worked well. You, you go in our store, you hear like hip hop and EDM music pumping. Like, you don't want to see the six year old white dude scooping ice cream when you're yeah. walking in that. It doesn't make sense, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, this is, not, this is not that cool if he, if he was scooping. Yeah, yeah, he's a nice guy now, but yeah. Um, how does that affect your um, turnover? Because a lot of younger students want better jobs. Well, the great thing about us, people love the culture of our brand, like the employees that work for us, like really enjoy the culture of our brand, so they stick with us for a really long time, whether they're already like overqualified at points, but they just really enjoy being there. We, we have a great, great work environment. So that's why it doesn't turn over. Yeah, thanks. Great.
You talk about uh, passion over profit, but you mentioned like the first thing you did was work for the real estate, and you're making good money there. I feel like it's just different, difficult to like envision like passion over profit when you're starting out and you haven't made it yet. I feel like it's like when you made it, it's like almost easier said than done. So like, how how did you like how do you like get that across? Like get that ingrained in your brain. Yeah. Yeah, when, I, when I was in that mind, when I was right there, I was making I was, I was making money. But I didn't want to do it anymore. Like if I had, if I had a chance, like at that time when I had a chance to jump into bowling, I was like I'm out. So I didn't need to make that money. And when I I was making more money doing that than I was doing in clothing in the beginning. It just took a lot of time. And I just and once you're doing something you really love, you're like, damn, I'd rather do this forever. Like forget like, that. But do you really need that much money? Like what am I gonna do? With, like, what do I need to do with that? Like, go to the club and pop more bottles? Like, <laughs> that's, that's just, I guess it's it's just like it's just a mindset. Like you, you, some people. You just gotta find out what, what works for you. Like holding, you know, drove me out of it. it drove me out of Raven Real Estate. Drove me away from the money. So, it's worked out well so far. Right now I'm doing okay. Yeah. Oh, it's for uh, Andy and Kevin. Uh, so you have Nick or Nick? My bad. <laughs> No <laughs> Andy and Nick. I don't know why I say Kevin. Uh, so, in terms of uh, like having customers in your restaurant or with the clothing, uh, for a restaurant, for instance, you have repeat customers that come in. Uh, so, what do you do in terms of uh, bringing in customers and making sure that they return to the restaurant or return to your clothing brand? Uh, and like, what strategies do you do to ensure that they're able to return and come back to your business? Get them in. Obviously, we're we're really good at getting customers in now. Like we figured it out. Like we know exactly how to utilize um, our social media and take care of that on that marketing side. So we like we're really really solid on that side. We can mm -hmm. get customers in. That's like no problem. Um, we do advice. You know, we we're really open about our. We share our story. Um, we have obviously ice cream and donuts. We post a picture of that. People are gonna gravitate towards that. It makes, a lot, makes it a lot easier for your market, you know, for your product, if you're going to come in. Uh, keeping customers there, obviously the service has, has to be a great experience in there. When you come in, you see, before us, you didn't see ice cream stores with black or white, or like those, the verbiage on that type of wall. Mm -hmm. You didn't hear that kind of music. You got like Baskin Robbins, and you had like, there's like no music in the store. It was like awkward. Yeah. We kind of gave it a different vibe, and I guess it, it works. It just resonates. That's why we've been so successful. And all age groups like ice cream, so there's something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't like ice cream, then. <laughs> How about for clothing? A little, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Kind of a totally different demographic. Um, you can kind of tell like donuts, ice cream, the lifestyle, right? Yeah. So, you know, obviously you can have a really cool atmosphere, ambiance. You can do Instagram post posts there. Everyone's like, oh, let's go so take an Instagram post in front of a certain text or something like that, right? Becomes a trend. Uh, with my demographic, you got to think you're trying to sell a $300 to $500 sneaker and shoe. Like shoes, uh, people are like, a $300 sneaker? Are you kidding me? You know what I mean? So that's where you really have to go into UX and UI, figure out who's looking at your website, how long they're staying, what's the age group. And at this point right now, the age group is so sporadic, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. I'm getting kids that this whole, these quote unquote hype beats that come to them that they want something similar to the industry that's out there. And then you have the 60 year old guy, like for example, and this is the answer to your question that um, how do you retain customers or how do you keep them coming back, right? One of my customers, my number one customer is Bernard Fitch. Within the last months, he spent 4500 He runs a big uh, social media platform to create commerce for, say, Kendall Jenner. They want a deal with Samsung, 500000 for post. He runs that kind of agency. For that kind of customer, you're look, for me being the sole unit in my company, I have to see who exactly is looking at it, who's buying. When I see someone like that, I'm at a Google, I'm like, holy crap, this guy spent 4500 that's a, that's more that's two mortgages you can buy in sneakers within three weeks to two weeks. So it's like, okay, who is this guy? What is this clientele? I'm gonna take the initiative and write my handwritten letter, send them a free pair, like, hey, this is coming out later this year. I just want to show my appreciation. But every single one is just a little bit different. You gotta figure out what type of customer it is. Obviously, age group, your demographic. That breaks it down to like well, almost a business mindset. You gotta look at all your schematics, whether whatever you use your Google Analytics, and figure out per customer. When you're in the beginning, um, I think this is another reason why Andy had to come out. When you're in the beginning, it's a totally different game. Every little thing is such a sensitive topic, right? So you don't want to skip out on anything that you can capitalize on. And um, I just wanted to add on to I think your question over there. Um, what I think Andy kind of meant was passion and profit. It isn't a numbers game. It's whatever you're passionate about, and this is quote unquote what Andy says, it's gonna take care of you. For me, I don't do this to be the next millionaire. This is my project that I'm so passionate about because I grew up with sneakers. If I end up making 60,000 a year, that's perfectly fine with me. But if you're passionate about something, it's gonna take care of you. Like if you're passionate about photography, I see you taking a lot of photography, right? Who knows, you'll be, maybe you'll be a freelance photographer and it's taking care of you just because you love it. You didn't think you were gonna be a photographer at the end, 
this job is so hard to find nowadays, it's like, okay, I'm gonna do that from hunting, but then all of a sudden it creates your career expense. So when I say it's not about a numbers game, if you're passionate about something, it's gonna take care of you. It's gonna pay for your rent, it's gonna pay for your idea. You know what I mean? It's not gonna make you the next millionaire, and it may make you the next millionaire. But if you're, you put the passion first over the profit, it's gonna take care of you, and it may just turn into that million dollar idea that you're thinking about. And then I have to this Thank you. you got uh, with, like, the ice cream market is a little bit here in right? Like, for instance, like, this event is a like, high year. So how do you try to stay relevant and prevent yourself from, like, falling out of this field? Um, we, we have our growth strategy. We, we know how the, the, the dessert market is. We've seen it with Fast Robbins to Yogurt Land, and we've seen how the rise of yogurt you know, increases the drop. Like, we know we have an exit. We have an exit. We're smart. We have an exit. Plan. We know like, we have to grow quickly. And we need to penetrate the market and we have to know when to get out. So we're trying. We will continue to be as relevant as we can, but probably in the next 10, 10 years, like, we're probably not going to be as cool anymore. Because we're, probably, like, they don't, you know, we're not going to understand the market, so that's why I'm like, we're very, like, take advantage of the moment now because we might not come again. And, uh, 10 years from now, like, my story's not going to be as cool. They don't, they're not going to be like, And I'm okay with that. And I'm probably going to be different, different things. That's why my goal is, like, food is not, like, not my end goal. I want to do other things like art, sports, you know, like I want to get into other fields and make an impact on the people. Yes. Hey. Okay, I have a question for you. For you, uh, Nick, uh, what did you major in and how did that help you with your, like, did it even help you with your shoe or did it give up? Yes, no. I tell myself no all the time. Um, I majored in business administration and finance. I only tell myself no because it's so expensive. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I went to USC, but anyways, totally different. But um, I majored in business administration and finance. Uh, I think yes, it did in the ways when I kind of tapped into network. You think when you're in that kind of school, you're with people that have the same mindset, right? So it kind of goes back to what Andy said. You surround yourself around those people. And there are things that are relative. Like I wouldn't be able to create like these Excel documents of my budget and finances and sales, anything like that, and expenses, and be able to look at my financial sheet and be like, holy crap, I'm in the negative, like far in the negative, you know? But it's like. If, you, if those are the types of basics where you learn in your intro classes, and the extra actually made, so yeah, I, I guess I do believe it did help me. So all these uh, extra graduate, um, what are they called now? I totally forgot. Um, whatever that you don't have to graduate with, you know, the extracurricular, whatever courses that you go into, um, they did help. Like I did an intro to entrepreneurship and, um, Elective. Elective, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I can think um, but yeah, they actually, really, you take stuff that you're interested in. I took uh, business law. Um, I took uh, intro to entrepreneurship. I took um, psychology. And like, I'll find myself there that I still don't want to accept this because I'm thinking about it right now. I find myself there on my desk and like, oh crap, I used that from psychology. Like, you want to have people's sense of belonging. So, like, when I build my brand, I always try to respond quick to my customers, anything like that, or I try to create a brand theory. Like Collegium is based off of ancient Rome means a guild of high intellectuals, uh, urban youth, uh, merchants, killers, just like a cool kind of collective. And today's meaning is an educating system. So I create a kind of secret society of an educating system about materialism and footwear and things like that. So that's one thing that you correlate directly to psychology, and I wouldn't have thought about that. It's like, okay, what's the most important thing? A sense of belonging when you build a brand, right? Because you want people to feel like they're part of it, not just spending $300 with it. And with my demographic, you have to build something like that. You have to build that connection. So, yes, but no, but yes. <laughs> I get it. And then for you with actors, I see you're just located with pretty much all your businesses in SoCal. Like, do you are you hesitant because you don't think the markets are good in other states or other borders, or are you just in the process of we, like we know we know we'll kill it in other places. Like we know we'll kill it in other like cities and countries. Like we just went to Australia, got back, so we're in talks, yeah, and negotiations. The reason why right, we we're only like two years and four months old, so like the learning process of how to grow that business and have the right infrastructure, uh, the facility, it's we're still learning. It's like figuring out like we got here so far, and so like. Now we need to figure out the steps of building the right facility so we can get to the other stores, which we're already working on. So we're trying to expand out, so we want to continue working on what we have now and then work on developing for other markets. And do you um, want to go internationally, or do you want to Hell yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> because of that? Uh, or do you think any, 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 of the business that, any of them that make sense for other places, then we'll, we'll work on putting it there, if it makes sense. Okay. I was going to say, I'll add to that, because I scaled internationally as far as wholesale internationally, and it's a totally different game, because you're and this is where business law comes in. So you're dealing with industries where you can't sign a contract saying you need to pay me by this date. You have to scale in a sense where it's almost a mutual understanding. Like I'm carried in Germany and London, 
and you don't know how you know customs is going to go over there. You don't know their tax rates. You don't know the currencies, you know, exchange and things like that. So once you start diving into that international market, you're looking at a thousand different other variables with, you know, and that you're you're talking about a different scale of money with those kind of variables. It's more effective. It's it'll cost right. you a lot. You guys more. do do international business. Like get your contracts with them done in the U.S. Yeah. Start slow. Yeah. Start and get into the U.S. and then then we're okay. yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is about like you scaling. So you have you decided to do that all in house? Like to, so it's you and four other people in your partnership? Yeah, like everything is corporate owned right now. Like we get franchise offers every single day. Like they, yeah, and VCs contact us all the time. Um, we know what position we're in right now, so we're being really smart about it and holding it tight. And we know that the cash flow is like completely crazy and, and for us, so that we're gonna just hold on to it. And we don't need to franchise out yet. Yeah, because it's so like. We're a franchise, they're gonna make their money back like that. And we're like, okay, why well, I just open my own instead of giving it to this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I can do it myself, but I keep it. So you're not, you're not planning on like franchise. We, we talk about like we talk about like, weird markets like like in, like Idaho and like Ohio that we don't plan on opening. Like maybe we'll let you do it. <laughs> like California, I'm gonna keep like. Yeah. All right. So my question applies to both of you guys. Um, so going back to the idea about uh, passion over profit. Um, I guess during the times you guys both started up, was there like ever like moments of adversity that discouraged you guys or made you guys doubt your passion? Yeah, I know a lot of times I didn't think I was, I was I was that good. Like I was good at good enough for it. You know, even um, from going to I'm King into afters. Like I didn't I, when I was doing clothing, I didn't know like anything. I didn't know I didn't do anything else. I was like, if I don't do well in this, I'm like done for. It. And there'd be so many points I would mess up because we were so young and we were careless. We didn't understand what to do yet. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of adversity. You know, there's times that you know, I'm like, well, my life is over, I'm screwed. Well, obviously, when afters happen, like I knew like, I could take my skills and things I've learned and apply to something else. Like I know now, like, if everything crash right now, I'll figure something out. Whether it's food or anything, I'll figure it out. I'll be okay. And I guess my answer to that is I'll give you two aspects, um, the business aspect and the motivation aspect. The motivation aspect is that you're going to doubt yourself every day. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard this saying, there's always someone better than you out there. Um, so at the end of the day, you kind of just close your eyes and keep going with it. Um, there's days where I'm like on, Instagram's like probably the worst for anyone that wants to start a company because you see other people doing other things like, holy crap, I got to stay competitive. Holy crap, that was really dope. I don't think I can do that. And um, like I told you, I was like, there's days where you're crying at the desk like, holy crap, uh, dude, you're just so overwhelmed with everything, especially like, I don't recommend starting something when I started. It's so expensive to start up. It's not the smartest thing. Maybe learn the ropes first instead of uh, diving in. Um, but in the second part, on the business aspect, there's plenty of adversity when you're starting up and you don't understand the industry as well. Um, so definitely try to find a mentor or something like that. Um, I'll give you one exa two examples. You ever heard saying, don't start business with friends? Don't do that. Uh, unless you know your role. <laughs> unless you guys are clear on your roles and make sure you always sign your documents first. I read in something like that. So. Yes, be clear of your roles, understand who is who and who's doing what. Second part of that aspect, you're going to be working with whatever industry you're in, there's vendors, there's plenty of people in that industry. You're going to be dealing with those people and Andy can justify this with 400 employees. Working with people is probably the hardest thing you'll have doing your job. Um, so one example for me, I wholesale. There's a shop in LA that hasn't paid in over 180 days, that's half a year. Then how do you figure out, then me as a young entrepreneur, I have to go, now you have to learn uh, how do small claims work, how do, how do I go do that, how do you sue somebody, how do you do something like that, and then that's a whole other adventure why you're still trying to run your marketing, your sales, your you know your logistics, anything like that, you're driving to the post office six hours of the day, and then you gotta upgrade, I gotta go to court in LA kind of thing. So those are the type of verses that you're gonna experience, and it'll leave you with two hours of sleep, um, and uh, you just, if you really want it, you want it. I won't kill hire. I won't be partnering my friends. I won't. I just won't hire my friends to work with me. <laughs> oh, actually, this is uh, this is for Nick. Um, so, going to a competitive school, um, did you feel like working alongside, or I guess competing against those types of students, made you kind of want to do this more, or did it help you out? Um, both. It helped. <coughs> 
because I had a competitive spirit. I was always in sports, and I just wanted you know to be compete with people. But at the same time, I was just so overwhelmed. Like you're talking like kids that have like crazy abs. They just ate. You're, you're talking about those kids that set a curve in high school, and now you're competing against every single one of them. Sorry. <laughs> Here we go. And like no matter if I studied for a week or like I'm not academic. I, I can just tell stories. <laughs> That's pretty much it is. So I would go in and I'm like, great, I study for a week, here goes, uh, here goes a C, and hopefully the curve brings me to a B, and I pass this class. Um, so in that aspect, academically, it discouraged me um, because it gave you an idea where But I actually just watched this YouTube video, right, it's something went viral, um, talking about two different types of intelligence, uh, creative intelligence and academic intelligence. Um, and I don't want to take too much time because I know you guys want to go. Um, but academic challenges, I think, is definitely foundated through school. We're taught to pass tests and get a 9 to 5 job. That's what academic is. We're allowed to put ourselves on papers like, I got a 3.4, um, I joined these X clubs, I am super great at passing tests and knowing curriculum. Um, creative to intelligence, I don't believe, is pushed in school at all. Um, creative intelligence, what I mean by that, is doing something like me and Andy like. And this goes down to kind of going to being resourceful. When I forgot who asked the question about how to be resourceful, um, you're gonna come. To, there's gonna come a time where things aren't written in a book for you to find out. Um, I'll take that last example: wholesale and doing a small claims. That's you don't know. You can't tell when someone's gonna screw you over. But being in the industry and being resourceful, it's like okay, I'm gonna ask everyone that's gone through this situation. And it's like okay, easy. Now it's easy. Now it's explained. Now because you can give them the dynamic of the situation. So. School is great, and it's going to teach you all the fundamentals and how to do it by the book, but it won't teach you the side of uh, creative intelligence of how to be resourceful and something some guys may just say street smarts, right, in layman's term. But that's how I would add to it. Another thing to that, um, you had mentioned make a five-year plan. Can you like uh, just give us like a brief description of what you see yourself doing in five years? Yeah, um, my five-year plan is to grow every year 30% growth in sales. Um, which is feasible, and I think that's actually by the book. Like, if you Google, like, how much you should sell a company per year, it's 30%. Um, obviously, I want to hit that benchmark. Um, I want to cultivate up to 20 wholesalers around the world. Um, my next thing would be opening a store within five years, um, because I think I have a crazy vision for my store. It's uh, doing a museum style, style the sneaker shop of artisan storage, which would be kind of cool to me. Um, and uh, yeah, that kind of falls into it. There's large dreams that I want to achieve in it. Um, like, I, like I said, I'm here for you guys to kind of see how it is being in the moment. By this time next year, I may not be here, but I'm, like I said, I'm going to be a back against the wall and fight for my life until I make it happen. So that's how I want to do it. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, do you feel like, I, have, I know you feel very confident in your product. I'm referring to after the ice cream. So um, do you feel like a lot of times with maybe specifically Yelp, that the product can override negative reviews about, say, customer service or venue? Um, yeah, obviously the hype. I mean, Do you feel like that happened with you? The hype control went crazy early on. Yeah, like. How, like, how crazy it got, like, so fast. Um, you kind of just, like, you kind of just let it run at that point. You, know, you just kind of have to just, you just focus on doing us and what got us there in the first place. And, Instead of just continue to figure out how to cater to every single person, which is not going to, you know, we can't make everyone happy. Uh, and we can't control, we can't control Yelp that much, and we can't control how the social media is sharing it like crazy. So we just focus on our own. That's what we can do. One more question, um, maybe for both of you. Do you feel like, um, do you ever consider race in terms of like niche market or like demographics? Do we, do we consider it? Yeah, we know like the, the food industry right now, like the Asian culture is very like leading on Yelp. Like you look at Yelp, there's probably lots of Asians on there. You know, the Asian market, they're probably gonna be the first ones to go there first, and everyone else is gonna follow. So yeah, of course we know what that is. Did you consider government. that when you? Um, hmm. after, 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 Fountain Valley was, was like a mixture city. Like we, we were open that, so it was the weirdest location. Like no one went there. We just kind of like, let's just try it here. We live here in this hometown. If we can kill it here, we can kill it anywhere else. So let's just work on. Location. Like that location, like people were like, why would you open here? They're like, I've never, even, they're like, I lived here my whole life and I've never been in this closet before. And I was like, you're right, I've never been in here either. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we can probably take like maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Um, if you guys can both touch on this, um, 
so like when you're coming up with an idea and you're kind of exploring your passions and everything like that, ideation from I think what a lot of people face, ideation is very hard. People always say like I don't I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what to do. And you've gotten to a point where you've launched a bunch. Um, in 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 your case, how did you figure out like this is what we're gonna go with next? Um, and then Nick with yours, like how do you like you know like how do you finalize the design? How do you think that yo? Once you do everything, this is the one that I'm going to go with. You know, like where do you guys get the inspiration for that, and how do you make the final call uh, before uh, moving forward? Obviously, we're always trying to push the envelope as much as we can. Of how crazy things you can get. Like, we want to make sure, like, is it is this item photo friendly? Yeah. Does it taste good? Like, yeah. you know, like those things we think of, and we try to find like, in certain areas. We'll open, like, we open the the, the pig pen, the pork, the, the bacon one. Uh, we knew that 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 food hall was missing. Like something crazy like that, so we knew that that's what we're gonna zero in because they don't, they didn't need, they didn't need chicken concept, they didn't need a rice concept, they didn't need a Mexican concept. So we're like, hey, let's try this bacon concept. And we just developed it from there. You know, yeah. bacon concept. Okay, I was like, next thing, I want the store. What do you still want the store to look like? I want it. I want it pink. <laughs> like pink. Yeah. So everything pink. You know. So we just kind of theme it out and kind of take it from there and line up the operation correctly and figure out how is food costs like, like keep food costs under control. Like, can this item be produced? Uh, can we streamline this process of this item? Mm. Um, even with uh, the milk, same thing with the milky bun early on, like the milky bun actually did not come to fruition until two months before we opened that after store. The after name was all ready, everything was ready. But we're at, we had like a waffle, we were doing like, waffle, like mini waffles, like different flavors, but then we couldn't execute it well and we couldn't streamline it well enough, so we decided to trash that idea. And we tried to do like taco shells and like waffle cone taco shells, and we're like, okay, well. This tastes like crap. So <laughs> let's go to the next idea, and then you know, we tried different things. We, you know, we tried the donut. We, ate, we, you know, we, we tested that, and we're like, okay, this is the one. Everyone vote. Good. So, so. Okay, cool. Yeah, it, was, it was easy to stream. Yeah. So, so. Totally different dynamic um, for huh. me, um, being in a different industry, demographics, um, different position in life. Um, as far as capital, for me, I have a really expensive uh, cost of goods. So. Decisions. This is if you guys are fortunate enough and have an investor, or you know, either one of you guys just you know, have a lot of money. Um, finance and design should never be together. Um, if you guys ever heard that in any of your classes, finance and designs will be the always the two that butt heads because like, oh, this is dope. Yeah, but it's not dope on paper. Um, so that's exactly what will happen for me. Handling it all, I have to be bipolar with it. <laughs> so I'll design something dope and then I'll look at the sales and um, you kind of look at the analytics of it and be like, I can't push this many units. Um, so you have to be holistic and when you're starting a company, like I was saying earlier, everything is under a magnifying glass. So you have to make sure you can hit that break even point, if not pass it. So you have to find the middle ground where you're moving culture and telling stories. So for me, everything's about materialism with stories with it. And I want to create these crazy colors that I know my hip hop and NBA clients will wear because they love being on the red car carpet. But I only sell, what, 10 pairs, 12 pairs? If I want to create something with story and the whole mass of people to believe in, it has to be standard to the general public. And that's coming from a finance background. But if you're coming from a design background, then you're like, I don't care what sales are. I'm going to make people like this. So for me, I have to find a middle ground between that. And you might find yourself finding middle grounds if you start something completely on your own. Yeah. Um, it really, you have to sit down, um, reflect, see what dynamic you're in. If, you're, if your cost of goods is really low, then do whatever the hell you want to do because you're like, all right, if I lose 500 bucks, it's 500 bucks. I'm going to move culture. If they like it, they like it. If they don't. And that's kind of the ideology of ice cream. You know, like Andy was saying, the cost of goods is low. So they're going to do something so different, so drastic to the industry. It doesn't really hurt your wallet. Your finance in your head isn't calculating like, holy crap, I'm going to be down 20 grand. Yeah. But you're creating something with a high cost, you're doing something tech, and every single project you do is like a 50,000 to 150,000 project. Yeah. Um, it's sensitive. It's really sensitive to the analytics behind your budgets and your finance and what your sales look like. So it just depends where you're at in that situation. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so something like I struggle with personally is being at this age, and you guys can both reflect on it, like, we want to go out and party, but we also want to be <laughs> successful, right? So, obviously, you guys both probably had to make sacrifices where it's like you had to lose some friends um, or say no to friends who are going to do something really fun. Like, how do you, how was that sacrifice for you guys? How's that? Yeah. How do you balance it? How do you balance it? Uh, is it set in 
day to be what's it, what's, your, what's my friend but you know seeing the success is they understood it, you know, like in the beginning and uh, even hell if you're not around like you know, I'm focused, like I want this is what I want, this is what I do. And so things sometimes you have to do things you don't like more than you can you know, reach your goals and you have that if you're passionate about that project, you're gonna do things that you love and you're also gonna do things that you don't like. You know, I don't like to do I don't like to look over numbers all day. I don't like you know, I don't like to sit there and try to figure out how to scoop the perfect scoop, like you want know, to do cool things. And I know the, the, the goal in the end and I'd rather work my foot off now and, and have easy things later. Like later I'd rather I'd, I'd rather be consulting than actually be operating the business. Consulting is a lot easier and fun and get paid stock. But, yeah. Yeah, same thing. I mean, you're going to have to do things you don't want to do. You're ready to like, let's turn up. And you're like, i got to turn down. Gotta <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, you're, you're going to be there. Um, and the sacrifice does suck. You're going to lose a lot of friends just because you'll have those friends who are like, oh, okay, like you understand, like, oh, I was only friends because we turned up cool. Like, it was really fun with you. And then all of a sudden, you're not there. They're like, who are you? Oh, and then you get those friends that text you like, oh, dude, I see success. Like, oh, let me get in on that. And then you're like, where were you when you were hating on me when I was doing it? You know, people only kind of reach out when you have success and you see people that you've never met before saying, yo, remember me from back then? And you don't remember them from back then. But it's a, <laughs> it's a part of that grind where you just, you've accepted that the friends that are there are going to be there from college, high school, whatever. Um, you're going to hit them up three months later like, yo, you want to kick it? And they're going to be there to kick it. And you can turn up then. But there's a... Uh, you can't turn up and work really hard. <laughs> it just the, those two things don't go in the same equation, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I guess that's the kind of balance you got to make that sacrifice if you really want it. Like I was saying in that earlier, I was like, you might wake up one day and you're 25 and you're like, dang, I'm still doing the same thing. And if you really want it, like I said, like Andy was saying, like I want it now so that in the future that I can, do, I'll be able to do it. if I want to help people. Like eventually, I want to create a shoe brand like Tom's, but create um, shoes that are actually durable, that you don't wear them for two days and they fall apart. Um, I want to help like the LA homeless and you know create shoes using materials that are sustainable, that can last them 10 years, and not do it for media. Like I'll have the capital and just be like, I don't care what you want me to do. I don't care if this is profitable. I'd rather lose 10,000 to actually make this project resourceful. You know, So to be in that position with the capital, that's what I want to get to. You can't do that if you're working for somebody, if you're asking for someone for money to fund this project. So that's my mentality on it. All right, we'll wrap it up. Uh, what's your guys' favorite uh, combination of actors? I do combination of actors? Yeah. Well, I've rarely eaten now, I'm like traumatized on it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you have to eat it, it'll probably be just on the camera, and I'll be like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but my favorite would be milk and I like the milk and cereal. I'm milk and cereal because you get the texture of ice cream and the crunchiness of the flakes or after flakes that we do. So that, that's my, my go to. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never really eaten a full milky bun either. We've always eaten like quarters like that time. After we finished testing, I was like, yeah, I'm done. Yes, I'm not touching anymore. So. I'm a simple guy. I like milk and cereal. On a fit life, I do lemon glaze. On a non fit life, I do glaze. So. <laughs> One, two, and three gift cards are given out for oh, after's ice cream. Oh. If you haven't signed up, if you if you want to win one, you have to sign up right here. Put your information in, like your name and email, and uh, in the meantime, just just card. sign up, and then we'll announce the winners. You can be really random. So also, we also have a, a geo filter on Snapchat, so please use it. Geo. <laughs> see that? No, I, I personally. No, for sure. For sure. <laughs>